were you a machinist on the floor and you just had a vision that you want to start your own company or why did you start? You know, I was a machinist in high school. I won't say a machinist. I was the guy running the saw. You know, I had a small shop, but I was the only non uh, family employee of the company. It was like me and the two sons. And that company grew for pretty well too. I, I worked there seven, eight years, a couple different times. From there I moved, I, I worked in several different jobs. I at, worked at a John Deere, I was grinding crankshafts for tractors and uh, I ended up at Rockwell Collins in the avionics division. You know, I learned a lot. Uh, prior to Rockwell, I actually was a manager of a shop that was part of a foundry. So I really learned a lot with the casting business and the raw material side, and we did a lot of work for the steel mills at the time. Solving problems, working with customers. Yep. Making chips. Uh, yeah, making, making chips. chips. <laughs> Probably the best thing that we did, you know, whether I can say this or not, but uh, you know, one of the <laughs> best things that happened to us, uh, and back in 92, you're in Iowa, right? Yeah. And and John Deere is like the, the golden ring to of grab course. for, you know. Yeah. And, and at that time, John Deere was cutting their vendor base. And I really think that that was a, you know, a blessing in disguise. Because we never got in, and, and so we just went a different way. And uh, one thing that we did that, that really is quite a bit different, it isn't as different now, but we would do anything anyone asked us to do. So we grew in, in different operations, you know, yeah, just from, you know, we're plasma cutting, flame cutting, laser cutting, robotic welding. We're doing our own induction hardening in-house. We're doing all these different processes in-house that most people don't do. But you see it more and more now where people are doing the fab and machine. Uh, so, you know, it's becoming more and more prevalent. There was a, a company where we're from. Yeah. Uh, on the West Coast, Applied Materials. Oh, yeah. Very similar yep. to the John Deere story. Very where much. Where there's so many different companies were just like trying to get in with Applied. And when uh, when I was running other companies, we were doing a lot of Applied work. And, and I saw it. I saw like everybody's high and then and they want to suck you up, you know, yeah. and, and they just want all of your time and they just take more and more and more. And then all of a sudden they go down and everyone yeah. goes down yeah. and the whole base like slow. Yep. And stuff. you probably had a lot of companies that you worked oh. with. Same thing, right? It's uh, when you. So it's so funny, right? When he you said John Deere and that right. golden ring and what you're looking yeah. for and all that. It's exactly the same company that came to my mind was was applied materials. I remember a guy, Lewis, that tried Delta, one of the first shops I called on, this was in back in 94, and I was young, I didn't know anything, and I went up to him, and I said, so what do you, you know, who do you do work for? Do you do work for Applied? And he says, oh, no, no, I'll yeah. never do work for Applied. You know, they build you up and they break you down. Right. And, and in the Bay, you know, working in the Silicon Valley, you would see guys that when you knew Applied was rolling, it'd be Ferraris and right, Porsches yeah, yeah. and everything in front of the, in front of the offices. And then... 18 months later, it'd be auction slips everywhere. Yeah. It was crazy. It's yeah. very cyclical. A lot of shops, you know, make that mistake of putting all their eggs in one yeah. basket. Yep, yep. And then before you know it, the eggs are broken. Yeah. yeah. And then and then they're one dimension. You know, that's like right. They're they're just doing. They're solving those problems, machining those parts, and it's like same thing. Contracts and contracts yep. and millions of dollars, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're yep. gone. And it's one job. One job. That they just yeah. fill you up with, and uh. What I heard you talking about was all these different processes right. that you put in place. It wasn't just one dimensional. You were like multi-generate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Multi-different processes, but also yeah. multi-different industries. We had, Great. Yeah. So in the end, we had less than 20% in any given industry and or customer. So we never had this huge monkey on our back of a customer and, and never in one given industry. When you started your company, did you have like bays? Were you in a building? Did you start in a garage? Like how did you start? So we, we started a really small, I, I think we rented 300 square feet from a guy and, wow. and, it, and, it, and it was great. You know, I went out and looked at it and it wasn't much to look at. It, it was a building he built and then stored corn in it, but it was like 20,000 square feet. And he told me, I'll rent your 500 square feet. And it was basically empty, you know, and, you, and as you grow, you can rent whatever you want it. So within, I think in uh, seven years, I think we outgrew the building and then built a 40 some thousand square foot. And and then at, at the one location where, you know, we, we moved from uh, 
Dyersville, Iowa to Farley, Iowa, which is five miles up the road, and then we started at 40,000 square feet, and I think it was like 135,000 square feet. So 40,000, and then you said you went up to 135,000. 135, we have a lot of machine shop owners and, and people following us and uh, watching this podcast. What is What allowed you to grow to having 200-something people? Like, what type of leadership did you stay were you the leader or did you just hire other great leaders, you know? You know, uh, for me, I basically stayed the leader, but I worked in the shop a lot. Everyone could, I, I, it is, you know, they, I wasn't afraid to do anything. I could program and run Huge. everything in the shop. Yep. Uh, and they all knew it. Yep. So it was kind of made them a little nervous, so to speak. Can't but, get one by on Rick. Uh, well, they knew, what, <laughs> yeah, they knew what to expect. Yep. And they were, they weren't going to come in with some half cock story about why something wouldn't work, yep. and, and you know that that's the whole thing. They try, you know, not all of them, but some people do. They'd rather not do it. You know, it's going to be tough. We don't want to do it. You know, it's like if you can't hold machinists accountable, like if you don't have the talent to actually run the machines, and you don't understand how they actually work, and you don't put that time in to learn it, how are you going to keep people accountable? And therefore. Where are you in time? You have no idea. You're just taking somebody's word for it. But machining, I mean, it is an art. It is, a, I mean, no, you can have a hundred machinists and every single one is different. And how the time it takes to make anything or do anything is vastly different. And those that are efficient and talented, they make great money and the shops do well. And those that don't, the shops don't, you know, 